All right, and here we are at Brandywine. General Washington's attempt to stop the British from reaching Philadelphia, the American capital. Now when I use Pub Battles to recreate the Battle of Brandywine, I do two things which I can do as a solo player. The first is I don't set up defending against a flank attack. And the second is that when the flank attack comes, the British have to enter in column along the Forks Road as they did historically. All right, let's go. Now I always start by drawing the Cornwallis shit first because nothing was happening until Cornwallis showed up. Nip Halston wasn't going to attack until Cornwallis attacked. And of course Washington was on the defensive and awaiting the British move. So Matthew's block enters, immediately comes out of column, and flank attacks Sullivan's troops along the Brandywine. The cavalry comes on and begins its own flanking move. The British column keeps coming on and spreads out to Matthew's left. Washington reacts ordering Maxwell's light, along with Armstrong's militia, into the woods along the Birmingham Road. And Pulaski's dragoons seal the space between the woods. Surprised, Sullivan's command falls back, occupying more favorable positions closer to Street Road. And then hearing Howe's arrival, Niphausen begins edging forward. Now due to his nearly 20 mile flanking march, Howe didn't arrive till the afternoon. There's only five turns of Brandywine before the end of the day. So it starts on turn four. Now we go to turn five. It's mid-afternoon. We begin with Niphausen bombarding across Chad's Ford. The Colonials are driven back. The rest of his forces come charging across the Brandywine. Now at this point, Niphausen is up by Chad's Ford. He's out of touch with the rest of his command. And so they surpass him. Meanwhile, Howe and Cornwallis press forward. Both British commands were drawn first. This allows Washington's colonial troops to respond. Here Sullivan's troops are on good ground and they elect to hold, but the rest of his command has wisely fallen back. Next, Washington has Knox's artillery attempt to silence the British artillery. Which it does, but it may be too late. I fear this early successful British crossing of Chad's Ford is going to be too much and will ultimately be the undoing of Washington's position. With Niphausen's flanking move, Green's position across Pyle's Ford has been compromised, and he orders them to fall back. Now we move into the combat phase. Here in the north, on the colonial right, we have Cornwallis's drive into Sullivan's men. And with heavy casualties, the colonials are driven back. Now Niphausen's assault across Chad's Ford. Now his forces crossed the Ford, even though the actual combat is taking place a ways back. They still pay for that. So the first round, they attack as though they were flanked. And they are bloody and repulsed, but the Colonials have lost a block. Now we move on to turn six, late afternoon. We begin with Niphausen, who unpacks bags east of Quentin's tavern and recovers his artillery. Now I'm tempted with Niphausen's command to send a block down here to attack these Colonial troops in the flank, send Ferguson's elite Highlanders forward down Nottingham Road here, and sends Stearns Heston's up against the Colonials over here. But this is a case where that's a little too much control over the situation. Something I can see as a player, but Niphausen wouldn't be able to act in all those different directions with all his troops. So what I allow is each command can do one thing. I can attack upstream, flank the Americans, but then I couldn't press the Colonials that I've driven back from the Brandywine, and that could cause problems. So I'm going to have to pass on that little opportunity there and continue pressing the colonial forces in front of me. Now I've still turned the block and prepared to attack in the center, but I haven't actually done that attack. I simply pushed forward with my original troops. And now Washington has General Knox bombard the British forces directly in front of him. The British skirmishing troops fall back from the fire. Sullivan is screaming he needs to be resupplied. His decimated troops need to recover. Washington responds and unpacks bags. Sullivan's troops recover, but now they in fact have to hold right where they are. He reinforces his line with Stevens' Virginians, and he finds a better position for his detachments to his right. This time Cornwallis has been picked last, and this might be all he needs to break the colonial line. Cornwallis attacks all along the colonial right, and Iphausen attacks Green on the colonial left. First we have a cavalry dust up, and the colonial cavalry falls back. 
Now the rest of the line. Well, that was dramatic and not what Howe and Cornwallis were hoping for. Maxwell and Militia drive back the Grenadiers. The colonial skirmishers stop the British troops in their tracks. And the drive on Sullivan's freshly resupplied troops was disastrous. The British have now lost two blocks, as have the colonial army. Let's see how Niphausen fares. Now this has been a bad, bad series of attacks for the British. Niphausen lost his elite Ferguson Highlanders, and the Hessians have been stopped. With the initial success at crossing the Brandywine here, I thought Niphausen was going to roll this up and it was going to be a done deal. But things have not turned out that way. Washington's troops have held out better. Can they continue to hold out? It's turn seven in the early evening. Washington is drawn first, and Maxwell steadies his militia. He positions his artillery to fire downstream on Niphausen's crossing. Niphausen has his exhausted troops fall back to Chad's Ford, where they can resupply. Cornwallis has his artillery fire on the colonials they can see, driving them back. Then he sends his brigade of Abercrombie's light for another attack. The rest of his line surges forward. Now Pulaski's dragoons can recover, but the British cavalry cannot because it's too close to enemy blocks. Sullivan screams the bags. He'd like to recover this block of Virginians, but they too are too close to the enemy. His light detachments stop the British in the woods and then fall back. Early evening combat, Maxwell's light reprise the battle with the Grenadiers. And although the militia has fled and is no longer here, the Grenadiers have been eliminated and the supporting Hessians driven out. Maxwell holds. And here, along the Brandywine, Sullivan has Lord Sterling and his Jersey boys face off against Abercrombie's light. What a dramatic end. There's still time for one more turn, but Howe and Cornwallis see the writing on the wall. They call for a withdrawal. This time Washington has won Brandywine. Looking at the casualties, you can see why. The British have lost all four of their elite blocks. And, worst of all, Bilbo's plucky little hobbits from the Shire have been lost. Meanwhile, the colonial losses have been light, although, just like at Gettysburg, Almost 75 years in the future, the first Minnesota has taken it on the chin. Those two blocks are just fun little promotional labels that I've swapped out with their actual historical counterparts. And there you have it, a resounding success for General Washington. This could even have ended British hopes in America when you've lost all of your elite units in one battle against supposedly questionable rebel troops. You have fought a very good battle.